Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Jeff Bazanz. My pronouns are he, his, and him, among others. Uh, and I'm your service leader this morning. I'll be joined by our minister, Reverend Rosemary Morrison. Uh, we hope that you, you in the sanctuary, you who are visiting, you online, and you who will be watching at some future date on YouTube, we hope that all of you feel welcome. Unitarian Church is a liberal, religious, multi-generational community. We are a collection of free-thinking, spiritually questing individuals joined in common support and action. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, however you identify, you are welcome here. I should note that for those of you who are new here, that this church is one of two Unitarian Universalist churches in Edmonton, the other being the Westwood Unitarian Congregation in the Park Allen neighborhood. We're grateful to all the volunteers who make this service possible. The list includes the greeters and ushers here in the sanctuary, all the people who work to deliver this service online, and those who created this service with words, images, and music. As we begin this special time together, I encourage you to speak with your devices and ask them very kindly to avoid outbursts for the next 70 or so minutes so that we can all enjoy the service. Now to kick the service off in a rousing fashion, let's start with some announcements. Uh, Ruth, would you like to start? Good morning, my name's Ruth Marriott, and is it a coincidence the color of my turtleneck versus the color of the tablecloths that you saw when you came into the foyer? Actually not. Marilyn Gay and I have been conspiring for a few weeks on the Right for Rights campaign, which has been an annual event at our church for I don't know how many years, and the yellow is the color of Amnesty International that, or, that organizes this. It's around the world. It's writing letters, but not just letters. You say, wait a minute, what about the postal strike? Well, yeah, I did remember that. Um, well, we've got a lot of options on that. Marilyn Gay is, thinks that she's going to be able to send some letters with a friend down to the US to be posted there. That's one option. In the folders that look like this, I borrowed one from the table, uh, there's email addresses. A letter, if it's written out old school, could be scanned and emailed to the recipients. There's loads of strictly electronically. You could send, write an email, you could send a letter of support to the person who's featured in one of the nine cases. There's also a whole lot of social media and confessions. I'm really not good with social media, etc. But I do know that the Right for Rights campaign has all sorts of materials prepared. So if you prefer to go through X, Facebook, um, Instagram, etc., you'll find lots of resources in order to show your support that way. So what is the campaign? It's basically a deluge of people saying we care about this particular case, going to the people that the decision makers and can influence, has influenced the situations of the people whose human rights have been abused. The other thing is that the, this campaign is not just today and it's not just December. It goes on until sometime in January. So if you imagine these government or judicial offices in different places around the world receiving floods of letters, social media, emails, etc., saying we're paying attention to this, we care about this issue. That's why it's not just one day. So take a look at the table after the service. We're going to be here till approximately one o'clock helping people. If you want to just take a look and ask some questions, we'll be here to help. Thank you, Ruth. Rosemary? Good morning to all brave souls who went out in the 
snow and the cold and the really yucky roads this morning. It was yucky out there driving into church. So good morning to you all here and to the folks online. My name is the Reverend Rosemary Morrison and it is my pleasure and honor to serve this congregation. The announcement that I have to make is with a bit of, um, what's the right word, when you wish you didn't have to make it. Regret, that's the word, big regret. Um, due to unforeseen circumstances beyond our control, as they say, um, we have to move Blue Christmas from December 17th here at 7 o'clock to December 18th, the following evening. Um, I apologize for that, even though it's no one's fault, but I will be happy to apologize on behalf of, of the entire system that created this uh, faux pas. Um, so, when is the new Blue Christmas date? 18th, December 18th. Let's say that together. December 18th. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. I think that's all the announcements. <clears throat> Um, I want to remind us that we gather, with gratitude, we gather with gratitude this morning on Treaty 6 land. We recognize that a treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May this recognition help us be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all our children. Now, I know that you've all heard this acknowledgement before, and probably some are getting tired of hearing the same words or similar words. But I really like this, this acknowledgement. The idea of being a good ancestor to all our children, not just those from my family, and the idea of a treaty being a responsibility and a relationship, those are powerful ideas for me. And I know that while reconciliation takes, needs some very large steps, small steps are important too. The small steps include growing awareness and understanding. I can re vaguely remember my first small step a few years after coming to Canada listening to an interview with George Erasmus. You might, some of you might remember him. He was a Dene leader who, be, who later became chief of the Assembly of First Nations. At that time, he was sort of a firebrand who was not afraid to threaten and use active resistance when it came to defending the rights of indigenous people. What I heard that day, though, in the interview was not so much a firebrand, but, a rather, but rather an intensely thoughtful and articulate individual who was trying to figure things out and to solve long-standing problems. I was an immigrant. I had no knowledge of indigenous history, which turns out to be like most native-born Canadians. Erasmus spoke about the issues with insight rather than anger or entitlement, and he opened my eyes. Murray Sinclair and others have since said, often said that reconciliation must begin with awareness and understanding and acknowledging the truth. George Erasmus started me on that path. About a month ago, I heard him again in an interview. He had just published a book. When I heard him, I remembered the lessons he had led, left for me decades earlier. And I still appreciate those lessons. Next, we move to a prelude. Karen Mills has selected some music for us to get in a reflective mood. It's Coventry Carol.
I just have to say that's not your average hymn book recita um, version of Coventry Carol. That was beautiful. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to invite Ruth Marriott to light the chalice for us. <clears throat> to get us started on the themes from today's service, consider two texts by the Buddha, selected by Reverend Rosemary, on a topic of today, today which is being present, living in the moment, moment, and simplicity. First, the past is already gone, the future is not yet here, there is only one moment for you to live, and that is the present moment. And the second text, in the end, only three things matter. How much you loved, how gently you lived, and how gracefully you let go of things not meant for you. Thank you, Ruth. So many things going on this time of year. It's the second week of Advent. We're getting ready for holiday season, be it Christmas or Hanukkah or something else that um, you might celebrate. But it's also Buddha's birthday. How many of you knew that before you got here? It was Buddha's birthday, yeah. Um, whether it really is or not is, of, uh, I'm sure, up for question. However, it is celebrated pretty widely um, across the world. So I just have some opening words for you on Buddha Day. Buddha Day is a defining event in the life of the historical Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, when he experienced enlightenment. It is observed at this time of year by traditional Zen and Buddhist schools of China, Korea, Japan, and Vietnam. And Vietnam. Bodai Day serves as a reminder amid all the hustle and bustle of the season to pause, to center down and reconnect with the inner wisdom that is available to all of us and practice mudita or appreciative joy. And I'll be talking more about appreciative joy later on. Here's a quote. Let us live in joy, not hating those who hate us. Among those who hate us, we live free of hate. Let us live in joy. Free from disease among those who are diseased. Among those who are diseased, let us live in joy. Let us live in joy, free from greed among the greedy. Among those who are greedy, we live free of greed. Let us live in joy, though we possess nothing. Let us live feeding on joy like the devas and that is from the buddha our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 16 in the in the gray in the gray hymnals i said um, and i said teal because most of the time we sing from the teal hymn books um, and the hymn is tis a gift to be simple it's number 16 and um, jeff reminded me this morning that this is an old traditional shaker hymn and so we'll enjoy that hymn and as we think about the Shakers. So we're bringing in all kinds of different religions and denominations this morning. So please rise as you are willing and able to sing hymn number 16, "'Tis a Gift to be Simple." <laughs> <laughs> 
Short and sweet. <laughs> Each week until Christmas, we light a new candle on the Advent wreath. The circle of greenery reminds us of the eternal cycle of all life without beginning or end. Last week, we lit the first candle as the symbol of hope of expectation. This morning, Art Breyer will light the second candle as a symbol of our longing for peace. We bring our hope into the world when we practice peacemaking. Our caring community aspires to be a source of freedom from violence and exclusion. As June Jordan writes, may we become the ones we have been waiting for. Together, may we strive to create lasting peace. And as our lights together we say, infinite spirit of life, teach us to seek peace, understanding and justice, and open our eyes and hearts to the work of making peace. Thank you, Art. Now we move to the audience participation portion of the program. Our church community is entirely uh, our church community is entirely self-governing and self-supporting. One of the responsibilities of our free church tradition is that we provide all the financial support for the work of our church. For the month of December, one half of the unidentified cash received will be given to the minister's discretionary fund. Maintained by our minister, Reverend Rosemary, this fund provides confidential assistance to those facing emergency financial needs, such as food, shelter, and safety. Your contributions directly support congregants and community members in this crisis. If you'd like to make a separate donation for this purpose, please use an envelope that can be found in the back of the, hard com uh, the hardcover hymn books or in the stand at the back of the sanctuary. And please indicate on that envelope that this is for the minister's discretionary fund. I should note that many of our members get, and friends give monthly or annually through automatic withdrawals and accounts. Okay, thank you all for your generosity and support. With our time and talents, our money, we support the work of this community and our Unitarian Universalist tradition. Let us join in singing, From You I Receive, hymn number four. Okay, this part of the service is allocated to reflections by the service leader. I have two admissions to make. First, if you're expecting my comments to be as entertaining as what we experienced last week with Cora Lee and John Spruill reenacting Dickens and Coriolis singing, forget it. <laughs> you're entitled to a refund, just talk to the ushers on the way out. <clears throat> Second, as much as I tried, I couldn't think of anything useful to say about the theme for today, about being in the present or living in the moment. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> My first reaction when I hear people say, be in the present, is, well, reactionary. <laughs> I have no choice but to be in the present, given that the past is gone and the future isn't here yet. Duh. And if being in the present means putting aside the past and ignoring the train wreck that apparently lies ahead, then, then I don't see any particular wisdom in that and certainly no evolutionary advantage. This kind of reactionary reaction, of course, comes, of course, from a simplistic interpretation of the message in Buddha's text and in the Shaker song. I told my partner, Jay, that I was having trouble coming up with anything enlightening to say about living in the present or being in the moment. And she said, oh, I get it. I was on a walking safari in South Africa and envisioned being attacked by a lion. I just hoped that I'd have the presence to feel his ears. I've always wondered what, what it would be like to feel what they would feel like. <clears throat> it would be great to feel them before he kills me. <clears throat> now, if she were able to do that, that would really be living in the moment. 
Maybe a real world case would be more to the point. A few weeks ago, I took a plane from Toronto to Edmonton. The boarding areas in Toronto and then in the plane were full of Swifties who had attended the first Taylor Swift concert in the country the night before. The boarding area was abuzz with people who didn't know each other, but all, who all connected with each other because they had been at the concert. Wasn't that an awesome concert? Yes, life-changing. The upbeat, positive vibe was absolutely palpable. On the plane, I sat, sat next to a 40-something mother and her 20-something daughter, both from Saskatoon, who were more than happy to describe to me the pure joy and excitement that came from being in a crowd of tens of thousands of people who were joyful and excited. Now, in my old view, the Taylor Swift concert phenomenon is sort of, a, is sort of weird. Millions of people across the world paying a billion dollars to see someone sing. For entertainment that is repeated 149, in 149 shows across five continents, with songs that can be heard, probably better, on recordings, with little regard to where that money goes and probably less care for who cannot attend because they can't afford the outrageous price for tickets, transportation, and accommodation. Really, how can we glorify that? <clears throat> Well, the Swifties in the crowd from Toronto to Edmonton made it clear to me that my analysis had missed the boat. For a few hours during the concert, they, young and older, were not thinking about the cost or the inequity or the difficulties they may have, have had prior to the conference, concert or about what, whatever issues awaited them at home. During the concert, life was simple, not complicated. During the concert, they were fully present, living in the moment, and the glow that resulted spilled all over the boarding area and the plane, and maybe beyond. Maybe for some it was, as one young woman said, life-changing. So what's that word for appreciative joy? Murita. It was there in spades. So maybe there is something to this idea of being present and living in the moment, and maybe Reverend Rosemary and the service will help me call this clear to those of us who are a bit skeptical, um, to see the sense in what the Buddha tried to make so clear long ago. <clears throat> I want to take this opportunity while I got the pulpit here to make a pitch. After the service, um, you will have the opportunity to write a letter for Amnesty International's Right for Rights campaign. I do this every year. I don't really know that my letter makes a difference for the particular person who is being held, but I'm pretty sure that millions of letters, and on their site they say 5.3 million actions in this movement, uh, that millions of letters raise, that, raise the profile and effectiveness of Amnesty International on the world stage. And I want Amnesty International to be effective on the world stage. So I contribute a few of my grains of sand. After the service, you'll have the opportunity to do the same at the back of the room or online, if you like. And I'm sure that doing so has something to do with being present. <laughs> um, <clears throat> One second here. Okay, so next we go to our, our hymn. Our next hymn is number 20, 224, Let Christmas Come. For those online, the text will appear on your screen. Please rise in body and spirit as we sing together hymn 224. <laughs> Another too short hymn. Who picked these anyway? <laughs> it would be me. 
So, does this sound familiar? There was a dream of a sacred being foretelling the birth of a prince. There was a bright light in the sky. There was a journey back to an ancestral home by a pregnant royal woman. There were miracles performed. There were prophecies foretold of the life of the child. Here is one telling of the story. About ten months after her dream of a white elephant entering her body and the sign that she would give birth to a great leader, Queen Maya was expecting her child. One day she went to the king, her husband, My dear, I have to go back to my parents. My baby is almost due. Since it was the custom in India for a wife to have her baby in her father's home, the king agreed, saying, Very well, I will make the necessary arrangements for you to go. The king then sent soldiers ahead to clear the road and gathered others to guard the queen as she was carried in a decorated palanquin. I don't know if I'm saying that word right, but if you think about the days in the ancient East where there would be someone of royalty in this beautifully decorated ca carriage and with poles on each end being carried by four people. The queen left her home in a very long word of a name that I can't say, in a long procession of soldiers and retainers headed for the capital of her father's kingdom. On the way to that country, the great procession processions passed a garden called Lambini Park. The garden was near the kingdom called Nepal, at the foot of the Himalayan mountains. The beautiful park with its salad trees and scented flowers and busy birds and bees attracted the queen. Since the park was a good resting place, the queen ordered the bearers to stop for a while. As she rested underneath one of the trees, her birth began and her baby was born. And in some tellings of the birth of Buddha, the baby comes out of the side of Queen Maya. It was an auspicious day. The birth took place on a full moon, which is now celebrated as Vesak, the festival of the triple event of Buddha's birth, enlightenment, and death in the year 623 before Common Era. According to legends about his birth, the baby began to walk seven steps forward, and at each step a lotus flower appeared on the ground. Then at the seventh stride, he stopped, because he was born fully formed and able to talk, he stopped and with a noble voice shouted, I am chief of the world. Eldest am I in the world. Foremost am I in the world. This is the last birth. There is now no more coming to be. After the birth of her son, she returned back home and the king learned of this. He was very happy. And as the news of the birth of the long-awaited heir spread across the kingdom, there was rejoicing all over the land. And this is from, which I buried the name of this, sorry, I should tell you where I got this from, Budanet, part one of the birth of the prince. Ancient birthing stories have so many similar motifs in them, don't they? Like we can look at so many of the birthing stories and see thing after thing after thing the same. Often there is a light in the sky. Often there, there is kings or queens coming. Often there is a miracle that takes place. Often there is a ancient and, or um, a spirited being or holy being of some kind that foretells the birth in a dream or something like that. And so many miracles. And sometimes, I was reading this thing, it was a meme, and then it disappeared. And I was kind of sad about that because I wanted to, to read some of it. But on this meme, it, it talked about the similarities between nine different world important leaders like Krishna and Buddha. And 
it was incredible how many things were the same. The star, the time, as the returning of the light, so sol the birth near the um, return of the light, near solstice or Saturnia. Um, uh, the person was often cruci sometimes crucified, resurrected. So all of these things are part of the motifs of ancient stories. Stories we all have to make, s that help us make sense of the world around us. And I love to study other cultures and religions. Good thing, I suppose, since I am a religious professional. And when I came across the saying on joy that was read earlier and that Jeff alluded to, I thought about how joy is also part of the Christmas Advent story. It got me wondering about the other three Advent themes and how they might relate to Buddhism. So I had a little look at Buddhism and the Advent themes together. So in Buddhism, the Four Noble Truths are the cornerstone of the Buddhist practice. Um, these noble truths are, there is suffering. There is the origin of suffering. There's the cessation of suffering. And finally, there is a path out of suffering. Last week, we lit the candle of hope. In some of my readings on Buddhism, hope is related to craving, and therefore craving or hope could be a source of suffering. As we wait in hope for the return of the light, does it cause us some kind of uneasiness? Are we somehow dissatisfied with things as they are now? Is it hope and craving that brings us to a place of wanting to do all the things that make this season merry and bright? I know for me, I want to make all the fancy cookies, mountains of them, entertain, buy the best presents for my loved ones, have the prettiest decorations, the cleanest house, the hostess with the mostest, and have the most wonderful services planned and prepared and executed for your enjoyment and Christmas uh, pleasure. This is true. Um, and hope, and, but hope can give us a glimpse into our true and better selves. We can hope that the world stops turning topsy-turvy. We can hope that suffering ends for a loved one, and we can hope that love will win out. Hope can almost be like a prayer, can't it? May we be filled with loving kindness is a kind of hope and prayer all rolled into one. I leave it to you to decide if hope is causing you suffering or if you are finding it brings you peace. And today we did light the candle of peace. Jesus was called the Prince of Peace, bringing the hope of peace to a world of brutal colonization by the Romans in the countries in the, in the Middle East. In the case of that, their ancient Near East, there was a great deal of need for both hope and peace in the time we tribute to the birth of Jesus. In the Four Noble Truths, peace is achieved with the cessation of suffering. Buddhism is all about peace and nonviolence as, as achievement of overcoming our complaints. When we can detach ourselves from our worries and woes, we will become a peaceful person, according to Buddhism. As we await, wait for the return of the light, we can find peace in knowing we are capable of enjoying this holiday season without running ourselves ragged. We can perhaps find peace by considering the needs of others. We can find peace by deciding we don't have to do all the things and be the best of all the things. I know many of you have already gotten to the place of realizing you don't have to do all the things. The Advent candle we are going to light next week is joy. The Christmas the holiday Hanukkah season is full of joy. Joy to the world to name just one of our Christmas carols full of joy. 
The opening words that I read, though somewhat obscure, talked about how if we detach ourselves from the pain of the world, we will find joy. I don't interpret this to mean that if we don't care about the suff- that we shouldn't care about the suffering of the world, only that when we encounter pain, we don't attach to it, bring it into our own being, kind of snuggle up to it, and wear the pain and suffering as if it was our own. In Buddhism, the idea is to detach from even our own pain, that we can experience pain and not suffer. In Buddhism, pain and suffering are divided. One of my favorite Buddha sayings is this, and I'm not sure Buddha said it. Pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. I ask myself the question sometimes, how can I experience joy if I and the world around me is suffering? I think this might take a lot of personal work, a lot of meditation, a lot of becoming very wise, or what Buddhists would call enlightened. If the absence of suffering is joy, let us experience joy even if things aren't to our liking. Even if we are experiencing pain, easy for me to say, I know. Even if things don't feel so merry and bright, And we'll be getting into that a little bit more deeply at Blue Christmas on the, what date? Very good. One of the problems I have with this concept of like pain is of kind of like pain is inevitable, suffering is optional, but when we are suffering, does that mean we're bringing it onto ourselves? So one of the things I don't actually like about this concept is it is a little bit of blame the victim. that has with it, and I, I struggle with that. And so, take all of this with a grain of salt. Opening ourselves up to compassion to others, and especially our I, ourselves, is perhaps a better way to think about this. If we or others are in pain, we can have compassion and caring and give support where we are able And we can ask for support to lighten our load when we are suffering. We are hardwired to be in community. And I think part of the role of being in a compassionate and caring community is to help alleviate suffering. Compassionate and caring and more importantly, loving. So we will light the candle of love on the Sunday before Christmas Eve, the last Sunday in the Advent season. We don't have to think very hard before we realize that every one of the major world's, world religions is based on the concept of love. The four kinds of love in Buddhist teachings are loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity. We can see these in the golden rule, treat each other as we would be treated. That's a form of equanimity. And I was kind of curious about what is appreciative joy exactly? That seemed like a bit of a concept that I wasn't actually totally familiar with. And it is, I looked it up and read quite a bit about it, and it's the feeling of happiness for others. So when others are happy, we have a lack of jealousy, perhaps, and we're happy for them. Like when somebody goes to Hawaii, and I don't, I can be happy for them, I suppose. We can practice appreciative joy in some different ways, by connecting with ourselves and others, so learning about ourselves. Being grateful for our own good intentions and noting when we are kind and building upon that. So when you're kind, take note and go, hey, that was a really nice, kind thing I did for someone. And that is part of appreciative joy. Salini Bal in the magazine Mindful says, appreciative joy is our innate ability to delight in what's good in the present moment independent of our circumstances or success. 
It's available to us when we're not pushing away unpleasant experiences and experiences, chasing after pleasant ones or running in circles. This kind of joy activates the parasympathetic system, the rest and digestive functions of our bodies that protect us from burnout and overwhelm, despite challenging situations, end of quote. So, back to our subtitle of this message, what would Buddha do? Perhaps Mary Oliver is right in her poem, Instructions for Life. Pay attention. Be astonished. Tell about it. My friends, this holiday season is not going to go as planned. Not for you, not for me. I've had some great Decembers and some very disappointing ones. I'm never very happy when I'm away from my family, and sometimes that is what happens. I always think that I'm going to make dozens of the most gorgeous cookies you have ever seen. So pretty that you dare not eat them. And I know deep down, and not very deep down as I say it, that that'll take way more time than I have. It doesn't matter though. Whenever I look back on my favorite times from Christmas's past, it is always the quiet, gentle moments that I savor. Quiet mornings sipping coffee be beside a lit tree before the sun comes up. Playing board games, well, mostly cribbage with my son. I love playing cribbage with my son. I usually lose. Finding ways to give back. Basking in the warm glow of love felt between kind hearts. And knowing that whatever happens, Christmas or Hanukkah or Festivus for the rest of us, will come. And we will rejoice in our own way at the return of the light. So here's the main point of this message. Please take time this holiday season for you. Do at least one thing that brings you joy so that you can have your cup filled. Rest, hydrate, go for walks. Eat some kind of cookie or treat that you love and garner up as many hugs as you can get. This is a special time, a time to give your presence, to be present, and to enjoy the presence of others. I think that's the point of it all, is to be together with friends and family that we love and actually just hang out with them and not be looking at our phones or even just watching a movie together. That, you can be present and watch a movie together and maybe have a conversation afterwards. That can happen too. But I agree with you. you like, where else are you going to be but the present, right? Yeah, the past is gone. The future hasn't happened. But I think when we're so busy with our work, our life, our families, our travels, sometimes we forget that what is right in front of us is what we need to pay attention to. It's about attention. Yeah. Thanks for asking the question. I realized I hadn't really fleshed that out here. Be there for others and be there for yourself. Find a moment besi beside some kind of twinkly light somewhere and delight in it. In a moment, we will have an opportunity to let our minds and hearts wander and wonder with a lovely video that I've chosen. So, give a hug to someone you love. Drink the eggnog. Listen to some cheesy seasonal music and watch a Hallmark movie if that's what you're into. It's all good. So um, they're going to pop this video on right away, and um, I hope you enjoy it. So we'll turn out pretty much all the lights, I think, especially, oh, look at that. That was Sarah McLaughlin's rendition of the Gordon Lightfoot on this winter's night. 
Let's continue on in a spirit of gentleness and quietude with a little short time of meditation after which we'll sing Spirit of Life. I invite you to put your, plant your feet on the floor if that will help you. To pay attention to the gravity pulling you to the center of the earth. I invite you to allow your breath to come into your body, give you life threat, life needing oxygen, and then releasing out what you no longer need. The breath is life. And as we focus in on our breath, it helps our heart slow down. Our systems settle and we can rest. I invite you into a time of silence, after which we'll sing Spirit of Life through twice. To show one another, oh, we light candles of joy and concern every Sunday to show one another that we are in community. It helps build community together. We have things going on in our lives that we need to share. So I invite you to come and light a candle of joy and concern or concern the ta- or both. The tables are open and ready for you. And if you like, while you're standing in the line, to wait to light the candle. You could if you wanted to. 
share with the person in front of you or behind you what it is your candle represents. I invite you now. Thank you to everyone that lit a candle and to those of you online that put your joys and concerns and or concerns on the chat. And I'm asking, Jeff is going to light one last candle for all of those unspoken and unidentified, I suppose, joys or concerns that remain in our hearts on this morning. Thank you. Our final hymn this morning is hymn number 1051. We are, for each child that's born, a morning star rises and speaks, sings to the universe who we are. I think this is a perfect song to, as we end thinking about how each and every one of us is special. And when there's special stories, there's usually a star involved. Please rise in body or in spirit to sing this somewhat difficult to sing
At this point, I invite Ruth Marriott to extinguish the flame in the chalice and the advent calendars. As the chalice is extinguished, consider these words selected by Reverend Rosemary by uh, Teach Not Hung. When you love someone, the best thing you can offer is your presence. How can you love if you are not there? The most precious gift we can offer others is our presence. When mindfulness embraces those we love, they will bloom like flowers. Thank you, Ruth. The light doesn't want to go out this morning. I'd like to offer my gratitude to each and every one of you that is here this morning and to those that may be watching afterwards next week or the week after or next year to those on the tech team and musicians and chair putter uppers and taker downers we don't need to take the chairs down though just so you know so let us off go and enjoy this advent season to the best of what it has to offer us enjoy the music enjoy the good food enjoy everything that you possibly can and get lots and lots of hugs and as Thich Nhat Hanh says Give your presence to others, for in that love they will bloom. So I invite you to go out and be a shining light and to bloom where you are planted. Go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. And now let us sing our linking song, Carry the Flame. And uh, for those of you who are new, we kind of make a circle and sort of hold hands and sing. <laughs> 